Okay, so um, we are going to continue our discussion about networks. Uh, I hope the assignment is going well. I am going to have some office hours right after class today for an hour, hour and a half or so. Um, so feel free to stop by if you'd like. Um, but today we're going to continue working on networks. And I think we're going to get to a point today where you go, oh, I see what's going on here with, with the way the internet works a little bit. And, uh, and hopefully it'll be interesting. But there is a handout because there's tons of code. And today is going to be another day where I'm not going to just like furiously type code. I actually did this lecture last quarter and it was a nightmare because it was like my fingers were cramped by the end of it and people were saying that's a ridiculous amount of code to put on the board or to try to do live. So you've got a whole bunch of code here. We will go through it slow enough um, on the board so that you can either take notes or ask whatever questions you have. So um, hopefully that will, uh, that will work out. All right. So let's go back to where we were at the end of Monday's lecture, which was to say we built our first client. And the client was as simple as basically saying, OK, we are going to create a client socket. And we're going to dig into those details. We're going to do it a little more manually today. Um, and you'll see some more details. But there will be details we see today that I don't want you to concentrate on. You can look at them and go, oh, those are some details. But I don't want you to think about those. We will talk about those next week. Um, but that's like how the connection is uh, built. And then uh, we basically set up a little uh, stream to be able to, in this case, uh, to be able to uh, read from the server, whatever the server tells us. And that's it. And then we're printing it out. So this is like the most basic server. Now, often you want to actually have some sort of like, you want to send the server some information, which we'll do by via the actual URL today. Um, and then, of course, you want to get more information back, maybe in, a, in another particular form. So we will see how that works with a couple of examples. Okay. So the first example we're going to look at, and I mentioned it, I talked a little bit about how it works, and I showed you an example on Monday, is this wget function. This is a built-in for the uh, for Linux, and you can see that by typing wget google.com, and it will actually pull down the results of google.com to your uh, to a file. In this case, it saves it as index.html, and that's it. So there's the Google uh, the Google homepage right there in an, in a file called index.html which I just used wget to get. It's a pretty simple thing. You need to request it from the website. The website sends it back to you. End of story. So that's what we're going to build. Okay, And here's what we're going to do with it. Okay, um, We are going to, we have to, remember the, uh, we're going to build the server part, as it turns out. Okay, And the, uh, in this case, or rather not the server part, sorry, we're going to build the client part in this case, which is going to uh, take a URL and it's going to get the URL and break it into its parts. Okay, So that's like, uh, Google's not a great example, but uh, web.stanford.edu slash class slash cs110 is like what you might pass into it. And what it needs to do is this is the part that you connect to, web.stanford.edu, and the rest is basically the path name. So we need to break that into uh, parts. So we can actually use the part, a parse URL function to do this. Okay, And most of our URLs are going to start with HTTP colon colon. Um, as it turns out, HTTP, that basically tells you, hey, you're going to the World Wide Web. Most of the websites you go to these days are HTTPS, which stands for secure, which is a much better way of doing it so that the data actually comes across encrypted. Um, because as, as you may or may not know, I mean, when radio signals get sent to the router, unless it's an encrypted site, all of the text that's sent back and forth is completely unencrypted. Now, if you have a password or if you have that sort of thing, they encrypt, they can, you can encrypt that in other ways. But in general, HTTP sites are not encrypted. Now, it doesn't matter that much for some sites. 
but it does mean that you could have what's called a man in the middle attack where you have, I guess you could for HTTPS too to some extent, but you could have um, an, uh, an attack where you think you're getting data back from a non-secure site and it's coming from some other site and that might not be what you want. So you should prefer HTTPS. For now, we're just going to do with HTTP because we don't want to deal with any, any encryption. Most of it actually happens at a lower level than what we're dealing with anyway. Um, but for now, we're going to go with HTTP. Okay? And the default path is just slash. That means like if you google.com, the default path is just slash. Okay? So what we're doing in here is we are basically pulling the uh, URL apart and we're just saying, look, if it starts with uh, if it starts with HTTP, then uh, we actually need to get the rest of it, which is what this substring line does here, okay? And then uh, you're then going to look for a slash, and if you, find, if you have a slash, everything after the slash is the actual path name, okay? So that's kind of what it is, and the rest is the uh, host Part of it, which is like google.com or stanford.web.stanford.edu. Okay, so that's all this is doing. Not that much to it. Um, it is returning a pair. Why is it returning a pair? Because C++ only allows you to return one thing. And so in this case, we're returning, we want to return both the host and a path. So we're returning a pair. You could also return a vector or a, an array or something like that, whatever. But um, the point is that in this case, we're just making a pair sending that back and uh, dealing with the first and second of the pair. Okay, pretty straightforward. Um, and this, this, by the way, means if you are trying to use the uh, find on the string, if the find is not found, that's string colon colon n pos, that means that you are going to use the default path, which is just slash. It means that you just said, hey, I want google.com with no uh, extra stuff on it, okay? So that's that. Uh, main in this case is just going to have one, it's going to call one function which is pull content, which is going to actually do the request and get the result back and then save it into a file. That's what we're doing. We'll, we'll break these up into other little parts as we go. But that's really all we're doing, right? We're going to a website, requesting the website, and then asking for the, and then getting the data, saving it to a file. That's all wget does, as it turns out. Okay? Questions on that? Yeah, awesome. Yes, that's like google.com slash, which is, yeah, that was your question. Google, what it's the slash part is the uh, default path. And that just means there's no extra stuff after the, the, the actual uh, website you're going to. We'll see why that makes a difference in a little bit. But it makes a difference for doing like class slash class slash CS110. That's our class, which is a shared website on all, the entire Stanford web service. So that's that. Good. Anybody else? Okay. All right, so pull content is going to do the actual, like, hey, we need to set up uh, a client socket. Okay, we will see, again, we'll see in a little bit doing some things a little different with this one. But for now, we're just going to set up the uh, client socket, okay? And we are going to then do a little error checking if, we, if the socket didn't get set up. Then we're setting up a stream, and the stream is going to be uh, to actually be able to send to the, uh, to the server to say, hey, give me the data. Okay, so we're setting up the stream, and then we're issuing a request. We are going to skip all the headers. Remember, when a website comes back, it actually gives you a whole bunch of details, and we're gonna look and we're gonna see those, some of those details a little later. And those details, uh, we don't care about for this website. You might care about them. You can ask for a, uh, you can ask for a website to be compressed coming back to you if you want. And so that would be a header saying, hey, this is the compression I chose. And then you'd have to decompress it yourself. But we're not going to worry about that. We're just getting raw text back from the server. Okay, and then we're going to actually have to save it to a file as well. Okay, so we're going to create a client socket. Okay, by the way, the, what we really need for that, we need just the first part, just the URL, because that's how you set it up. We don't care that it's slash class slash CS110, we care that it's web.stanford.edu. That's what we're connecting to on a particular port. For the internet, ports are 80. Like that's the main internet port. Sometimes you also see 8080 or 8000 or whatever. Those are some kind of default ones. But the World Wide Web lives on port 80 for uh, servers. It's just generally where it lives. 
Okay? And again, you can change that. If you have a home network that you don't want any other people to know about, you can say, hey, forward my traffic to a different port or get, it, get my website from a different port, then people won't necessarily know how to connect to it unless they say the port number. That's, uh, that's the way that works. Okay. What questions do you have on this? Yes. The components is the uh, pair that we passed in. It's the host and the actual path name or path. Yeah, good question. Anybody else? All right, still pretty, pretty straightforward so far. Okay, now we have to start doing the details. Now remember when I did Telnet the other day, okay, the Telnet command uh, for internet websites or not the Telnet command, the actual HTTP request is very well defined. And it starts out with get, and then the path, and then it says what protocol we're using, in this case HTTP 1.0 or 1.1, probably doesn't matter which one you use in this case. Um, and then it has this interesting backslash R backslash N. Well, we know what backslash N means. It means new line. Well, it kind of means new line, but really it means new line in the sense that it means uh, go directly down to the next line. The backslash R is what we call a carriage return. And a carriage return comes from the typewriter days where when you hit like the, well, it used to be you actually had to hit a little lever that pushed this carriage where the uh, paper was moving back and forth. Um, that's what happened in typewriters. You should check them out sometime. Come to my office, you can see a cool typewriter project, um, or a couple of them. And anyway, the carriage return meant that the entire paper would go zoomp back to the other side. Uh, I guess from your perspective, it sits there, shoot back to the other side. And that's what's happening with uh, the backslash R. Uh, backslash R, backslash N is what you really should send whenever you are saying, I am done with a line to the server. Okay, it just happens to be, that's the way it was, that's the way it uh, ends up working out. Unix just kind of doesn't really use the backslash R often, it just means, look, I want to go to the next line and go all the way to the front. This, but you do need the backslash R in there as well. Yeah, question mark. Why don't you use end L? Good question. End L will only send a backslash N, as it turns out. Yeah, good question, though. Backslash N, end L just does the, uh, back, it's the Unix way of doing it. It just does backslash N, which is not just what we want. OK, so it does that. Then the next line, it says the host that you're on. And the actual, it takes the host and then another uh, backslash R backslash N. Telnet will send that for you, by the way, correctly. And then uh, we send another blank line to say we're done with our request. And then we flush. Now we have to flush the actual data, which means if it's buffered in the system somewhere, make sure it actually gets to the other computer. Okay, sometimes if you don't, it's like if you don't do backslash N when you do printf or the end L, sometimes the characters won't show up until you get that end L. This is what the flush is all about. It says, look, make sure the data is sent, because otherwise the web server will have no idea when to respond or not. Okay, let's do this example again. Yeah, um, Davis, while so I'm pulling up the example. So does the flush just check that the data is sent, or do you have to put the flush No, the flush doesn't check anything. It just actually says, oh, if I've got some buffered data I haven't sent yet, make sure it goes out. That's really what it does. It just says I could buffer it and, and keep it to myself because I'm, I'm going to collect it all and then send it all at once. It says, look, now I want you to send it. Definitely send it now. That's what it's there for. Yeah? Could you flush earlier? You could have flushed earlier. Sure. It doesn't really matter. The, remember, the web server is expecting all of the data. It won't do anything until it gets all of it. Good question. Yeah, next thing. Yeah, good question. Why do you need to flush? It just turns out that there might be a situation where without a, um, just the, the backslash n might not actually do the push, it like actually might not say, I've got enough data to send, and it, it, who knows. But the flush definitely says, look, I'm ready to send the data, make sure it goes, all of it goes from this point forward. That's how it works. That's what? It's a safeguard in that sense. I, I, we could try it without it and see if it works, but it, the odds are that it, eh, it might work. New lines normally send a flush, but you just never know in this case. Yeah, let me show you. If we do telnet uh, google.com 80, right? And then we say get, right? We need the path name, okay? So that's the actual, that's the path name. I'll show it to you again in the, you can look in the code, but I'll show you it again. And then we say, we are gonna tell it what one, 
uh, slash one point, I guess 1.0 in this case for our example. Okay, and then we send a return. Then we say host, and in this case www.google.com, and then you hit a new line, and then it come it gets all out there. So that is the three things we needed to send, and that's exactly what we're sending in our program. Let's take a look. We're saying get right here. Okay, we're saying you know you know every time I connect to my this this tablet doesn't seem to work when I connect to when I try to go back and forth between programs. I don't exactly know why, but there it goes. Okay, uh, so we do the get, and then we do the path, which in this case was slash. There was no path for Google, and we didn't we wanted the original index.html, the original like slash path. And then we say, oh, we're doing HTTP 1.0, new line. And the next line, we tell it what host we're on. This is the google.com, www.google.com, and then we send a couple new lines. The order does matter. Yeah. It expects it in exactly this order. Why would you want the host second? Why would you want the host second? I don't know. That's the way they designed the protocol. <laughs> I mean, you're already connected to Google.com. You already know you're connected there. But then it just says, hey, which particular host of... It might be that the, that the website you're connected to has multiple IP addresses but different hosts on that IP address. Like, I don't know. Yeah, like Max. Yeah, it's something else. Google.com, Docs.google.com might be a different one too. Yeah, it might might need that. Yep. Um, so is Wget is Telnet part of Wget? No, good question. Telnet is Telnet is just a way to connect via the terminal. That's all that is. Wget is the program that's doing this via a network. We're writing it. You'll see how you know the actual word, but we're writing the program Wget, which asks, requests the website, gets it, downloads it, saves it to a file. That's what wget does. Question. Anybody else? Okay. So that's all the issue request function is going to do. It basically says, "Hey, get the request." Okay. And then we need to uh, do what? We need to skip all these headers. Um, skipping the headers is relatively straightforward. You read a bunch of lines until you get an empty line. <laughs> okay. So there's a whole bunch of the first thing that comes back from the web server is all this header information. And the way it's defined is header, 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 blank line, the rest is data. That's all it is. In this case, we don't care what those headers are. We could print them out if we wanted to, or we could look at them or whatever, but for our purposes, we don't, we don't care. So all we're doing is doing a whole bunch of get lines, and when, until the line is empty, we're just going to keep reading them. Now, some servers aren't nice and they just send new lines because some people who write these things don't realize that you also need the backslash R. We will also, if we just get a line that has a backslash R on it, we will also figure that as just a new line. Yeah, it's just kind of a hack in that case. Yeah. Just a C++ question. Mm -hmm. um, why are we doing the do uh, with the while condition instead of just like a straight like post? Why are we doing a do while? Yeah. I think it probably saves a line of code. I mean, you would have to set the, you'd have to basically set the line up to be not empty, and then you see what I mean? Like you'd have to set it up in some other, some other way, say it in some default value, and then do while, and then get it. I mean, you could do it, sure, but in this case, yeah, it just saves a line or two of code. Yeah, so this is a good question. So why why get? Well, get is one of the ways you can request information from a uh, web server. You can also do a post, which is uh, which means I'm sending data to the web server. Like I have a file I want to send, or a name, or or you know something else. You do a post. You can also do oh, there's another one that you're going to do for next assignment, and I'm forgetting what it is. There's a there's more of them too, but it's just it's part of the language of HTTP. That's all it is. It's just the HTTP. Protocol. One of the things you do is you use get or you use post or you use some of these other ones. Chase. Um, so, what happens if you just do slash r and not slash n? If you just do slash r and not slash n, the web server might get confused. Okay. I mean, it just might go, ah, are you done with the line yet? I don't know. Okay. You know, just you, that's why you need the protocol says you have to have both, so we send both. Okay. That's the way it works. And again, this is why when computers talk to each other, they need to know exactly the right information. This is why we hammer this into you in 106A and B and 107, whatever, that it has to be exactly the same output. And it's not just because we're being jerks about it. 
It's so that computers could, and it's because our auto graders are computers, <laughs> right? They're trying to talk too, but it's, you will see this again and again and again. You need to be exact in your output. So it's exact same. Yeah. The header information contains what kind of data is it sending back, whether or not, and we'll see this example, we'll see an example of some header data we care about later. Um, it's got whether or not it's compressed, it's got a whole bunch, whether or not uh, the website can ask for the data when it's not on the website. I mean, so many times a website doesn't just willy-nilly give data to some other computer through certain methods. And this, in this case, the, the header could tell you, yeah, it's okay, or maybe we don't want to do that. Whether it's cached or not, I mean, there's lots of different headers. You can just look up HTTP headers and see the hundreds of them that it could be. And the, the header is always separated by like a slash bar or line? Yeah, a header, it's, a, it's one line at a time. One header, another header, another header, another, and then the last one is a blank line, okay. and then we're into data. Okay. Yeah, that's just the protocol. It's pretty straight, pretty simple, all, all things considered. Whole bunch of headers, new line, data. That's all there is to it. Okay. All right. So uh, that's that. Um, let's see. As we go to the next one here. Oh, there we go. Ooh, that's not what I wanted to do. Oh, no. Hold on. There we go. Okay. Uh, so we are going to then look at the get file name. Function okay, and by the way, this is all because all like in you can look at the code and see what happens, but it's basically we're just decomposing this into here. Um, the get file name is just going to take the path, and it's going to convert the path to a uh, a file name if it's if it's the uh, or I guess the last part of the path to the file name. If it doesn't have a file name, it uses index.html, which is like the default file name for web pages. If you've never done any web, uh, if you've ever done any web uh, writing, you'll probably have seen index.html, which is basically the like first page you get to on a web page. Normally, that's the way the way that works. Okay, so it's pretty easy to do. It just basically says, look, if the path is empty or if uh, you've got a slash at the end, just return index.html. Okay. Um, otherwise, you are going to uh, you are going to find everything from the last slash, this is what the R find does, and uh, return that part of it. That's all there is to it. Okay, so it's just finding the actual file name because we're about to write the file out. Okay, so uh, what do we have to do for saving the payload? Well, we have to uh, read in, okay, we're gonna be given a file name to save to, which we're gonna get from get file name, and we're gonna be given some stream that we are going to be, uh, in this case, uh, reading from. That's the network, basically. Okay, we're going to set this up and get the network stream that we're going to be reading from, so we can read all the data. Okay, and how are we going to do that? We are going to uh, basically say, while we are not have not read all the data, this is the do. This is a while do because we can do that in this case. As it turns out, for this kind of stream, we can do that. And then we just read all the data. Right? We're going to try to read as much as we can into our buffer, which is a fixed length. Why 2014? I don't know. It's made it 2014. It could be whatever we want. And then uh, we count up all the data, and then uh, we write it out to the, uh, the uh, buffer that we actually, or sorry, we write it out to the, uh, we write it to the buffer, and then, let's see. Sorry, we're reading it into the buffer. Sorry, we're writing it to the output. We are writing the buffer to the output, the amount of data that we read. That's all there is to that. Okay. And then it said it counted up how many bytes, so we know how many bytes got read. Yeah. Um, where do we need the get file name function? Because we already did the two parts, so we got like the the first function we were right. like the pair, like the Yeah, that's a good question. Why do we need the get file name function? Remember, what if what would the file name be if I asked for web.stanford.edu slash class? slash CS110. Would it be class slash CS110? That doesn't really make sense for a, for a file name. So we just want the last part of it. So in this case, it would be CS110, which actually wouldn't work for ours because we would be, we'd have to request CS110 slash. But if we did, this would be the file name, just the last part of it. So we got the path, which we're going to request, but then the file name is just the last part of the path. It's, it's a bit, you know, we're just creating that because that's the way wget works. Yeah. Are you just like rough class? Like, could you explain what I 
Yeah, so what is an IO SOC stream? Okay, this is, so you know how you can do C out, and you can do that, and, and you can do C out stuff and it works. Well, that's a stream. And a stream is C++'s way of saying, hey, here's some relatively easy ways of doing input and output. IO SOC stream is a class that's created to make, wrap a network file descriptor into a stream so that it's easy to use. That's all IO SOC stream is. Just a class that we're using to make it easy to do so that we can do things like uh, we can do things like output.write, we can do things like, where do we read in from the SS? Right here, ss.read, right? That's like you do that from the stream and so forth. And it buffers it all for you and you don't need to worry about uh, the, having a while loop that does, you know, certain only certain amount of data and so it, it does all that for you. David, you had a question? Related question, yeah. what does ss.gcount do? ss.gcount uh, is the amount of data you get you got back I believe I believe that's what it is so it basically says how much we just read well how much did we just read all right and then it just up keeps that updated from the read all right all right so these are all kind of helper functions right now that we're that we're dealing with okay um, so let's see was that the only no, that was it actually that's the we, we've actually done everything and it sounds did I miss a it looks no, we didn't miss anything. We actually had all of it in here because we needed to first issue the request, which we saw how to do here, the get request, okay? And then we skip all the headers, read all those headers and then the new line, and then we save the payload, which is everything after the headers, okay? Did, I, did we not have this? Did I skip the skip headers function? No, there it is. There it is. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so it just reads all that. All right, so that's how. That's all we have to do in this case. Okay, and that's it. Let's check. Let's check it out and see that it works. Okay, uh, let's see. CS one ten spring live lecture. Move that out of the way. Okay, and then if we do networking, and we do W web get, and let's try Google.com. Right, well it says fetch 219 bytes, which means something went wrong there. Let's look at it. Uh, it probably means that it didn't have the right, let's see, vim uh, index.html. Yeah, it says it has moved to google.com slash. <laughs> so we need to do slash. And, oh, mm, oh we need, did we need the www? Probably. There we go. Now we've got enough bytes. We've got 46,000 bytes. So that actually works. What was going on? If we did the, if we did without, like we did www, if we did just google.com without the www, well, if we look at what it says, it says, hey, that document has moved to www.google.com. So that's just the, that's, yeah, it basically, there's a difference between google.com and www.google.com, right? And so Google has set it up such that whenever you ask for google.com, it says, no, 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 please ask for www.google.com. And your browser does all that for you. If you just type google.com, it'll go to google.com, get this message back, and go, oh, I got to do another request and get the real version back. That's all that's happening. Yeah. Uh, this question about the save payload function. Yeah, let me pull it up, the save payload function. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what was the saying backslash zero for him? The, the buffer, what does that do? Ah, good question. So in this case, because we're trying to read, the, the question was, why is there a terminating backslash? I guess I skipped right over that. When you, uh, you're reading in, uh, this actually says, hey, create the entire buffer full of zeros, is what it does in this case. So they're all already zeros. So it doesn't mean, it means you don't have to put one at the end when you've read all the data in. So it's already strings, yeah, good question. Okay, Gamma. Would you also have to close the output? Uh, no. In this case, OF stream, you don't need to close those, like this case. Yeah, it, I think, actually, I believe it gets closed when it goes out of scope, because of the way it works. I think so. All right. Now, let's look at a much more interesting and kind of a cool example that by the end of, um, I think you'll see that you go, oh, this is cool, and this is how the internet works, and this is how... This is not really how you would necessarily create a web page, but it's pretty close as it turns out. Okay, you don't necessarily need to create your own web server. Most of the times when you put a page on a server, it will get run 
for you by the web server which is already running on your computer. We're going to do a much more lower level version of this right now, but it, but it basically you can kind of see what the web server has to do to get your data to shoot it out to a um, some other client that requests it. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at uh, and we're going to look at an example that which has. Um, which is kind of, it's an AP, it's got an API associated with it, right? Basically an application programming interface, which basically means we know what we have to send to the server and it will give us back data in some form that we can understand. Okay, who here has heard of JSON before? J-S-O-N. Okay, almost everybody, not quite everybody. J-S-O-N is a format that's machine readable, but also pretty human readable. Okay, and we'll see the actual format when we get to it. But we're going to output our results of what I'm going to show you in this format so that if we wanted to, and at the end I'll show you a little web page I built that uses that, we can actually get the data formatted such that our computer can understand it and do something interesting with it. Put it on the screen in an interesting way or use it to do some calculations or, or whatever. But that's what we're going to end up um, creating. So what we're going to do is we're going to create this little program that uses a program called Scrabble Word Finder. And this program, you certainly can go look at it, but that's a 106B program. Basically takes letters that you might have from, a, who's played Scrabble before? Mostly everybody? Word Finder, some other like words with friends, whatever. You have a number of letters and the number of letters you have to use to make words and they're all scrambled, scrambled up. And this program will find all the words in a dictionary that are come from those letters. Okay, so that's all it's going to do. Let me show you an example of this. Uh, let's see. Scrabble Word Finder Stanford. Okay, and it will print out all the different words that you can make from the letters in Stanford. Okay, that's what the program does. Okay, and yeah, make whatever words are in the dictionary it will make. Okay, uh, Scrabble Word Finder Network. Okay, we'll print out all the ones that happen to uh, be words you can make from network, and that's what we're going to use. So let's pretend we have a, uh, a website that wants to do this. Well, we might create a Stanford, we might create a Scrabble Word Finder program that does exactly this. It takes as a parameter into the program the letters, and it, it spits out all the words that create from those, created from those letters. Okay? So what we want to do is we want to do a server that uses this program or does the same thing except instead of printing it out to the screen it shoots it off to our client in a form that the client can understand namely json format okay you might think okay let's go into the scrabble word finder program wherever it does c out let's set up a network connection let's do a client or a, a, we'll do a little server connection and we'll have an accept and all that no why would we do that if we've already got a program that works perfectly well? There was an assignment you all did where you used other programs and got the results from those programs. What was that program you wrote? Subprocess, right? This, let's leverage subprocess to actually get the words from this exact program. And our server needs to be this tiny little thing which basically just translates, request comes in, use the Scrabble word finder, get the words, send them back to the client. End of story. Okay? And there's a fair amount of details that, that we're going to go through as we do this. Um, but as you see, that, that's what we want to do. We don't want to modify the program that already works perfectly well if we can use a subprocess to do this. Okay? All right. Here's what JSON looks like, by the way. Um, this is a, the results of what we're going to do. We're going to uh, run this program, let's uh, run this server, let's say it's on port 13133 on myth 54, and when we request myth 54 colon 13133 slash lexical, we will take lexical and feed those letters into our Scrabble word finder. So we need to, we need to figure this, and we need to parse out the various you know, parts of this so that we can get the letters from that, so we're going to have to do that, and then we're going to generate something like this. We are going to say how long it took to do the request. We are going to say whether or not it was cached or not. 
So the assignment, not this assignment, but the next assignment, in fact, the big networking assignment you're going to do is a uh, web cache uh, program, which is actually kind of cool. But caching in networking basically means if you've already done something before, don't do it again. <laughs> because networking itself is relatively slow, but in this case, it's not really that. It's really, if the program, if we have already gotten a bunch of letters and we've already converted them into words, we might as well save those words in case somebody requests those same letters again in a cache. And we're just going to report back whether or not it was cached. Why would the client care about this? Who knows? Maybe the client cares about it. But we're going to tell them whether or not it was cached. And then it's just, whoops, and then it's just going to be a, uh, an array of all of the words. Okay? So this is actually a little, it's basically a map. Time, and then it gives the time, comma, uh, cached, false, and then possibilities, and it's an array. This is what JSON looks like. Notice it's relatively readable. Once you understand that, oh, this is what a, what a map looks like in JSON, you go, oh, now I can read it. That's pretty straightforward. And your, uh, your JavaScript program can read that very easily, as it turns out, which is what the, you're going to probably be requesting the uh, server, the client data from. Okay. All right, so that's what we're going to end up doing here by doing this. Let's see what we, how we're going to actually do this. We're going to leverage, as I said, uh, we're going to leverage subprocess to do this. And it's um, just going to, we're just going to use it, get the output, and do that. Do we need to send any data into the Scrabble Word Finder? No, which we're doing it via the command line. So we don't actually need to actually say what the letters are. We could have set the program to do that, but we just do it by the command line. So it's going to be uh, fairly straightforward. OK, so here's the main function. What's the main function do for our server? It should look relatively similar to other servers. Let's see, let me find this on here so you guys can copy along. It is on page uh, three, maybe? No. It's on page eight. Oh, that's right, it's at the end of the program, right. On page eight, sorry. So on page eight is where the actual main is for this. OK, so what we're doing here is we are setting up the server kind of like what we've done in the in the past okay we are going to uh, create the ooh, cre I, that's right I'm zoomed in here we're going to create the server socket okay we are first going to extract the port that's actually a relatively easy easy thing we're basically just going to get that from the command line <laughs> all right and then we're going to get the port number because what you can do is um, you are going when you run this you can say what port you want to run it on and then um, we are going to if you don't, it's going to have a default. And then we are going to create the ser server socket. Okay? And then we're going to say we're, what we're, port we're listening on. Big deal. We're going to set up this thing called a thread pool. Remember, the reason we're doing this is so that we can accept connections very quickly, up to 16 connections very quickly, and shoot off threads based on those uh, connections. Okay? So it's going to be uh, a way to do that. You will build thread pool for the next assignment. Okay, then we're going to have a cache, and in this case, the cache is going to be the letters uh, mapped to the vector of the strings of the result. What do you think we're going to have to do to the strings to make sure that if we get A, B, C, D, and then we get D, C, B, A, aren't those going to create the exact same set of words? What should we do to this, to the word we get in before putting it in our map? Yeah, sort it. Just put it in and sort it because they're all going to be the same. So we will do that. OK. Then we are going to need a mutex. Because we're dealing with threads, we're going to need a mutex for the cache lock here, or for the cache, basically because if we're reading from the cache and anybody else is trying to write to it at the exact time, that could be bad news. We might get the wrong data. It might corrupt something. The writing might get corrupted. You know, something might go on. It's probably not going to actually corrupt anything. But you might get the wrong data, or it may actually uh, end up being in a situation where the state is not known. So we're going to need to lock anytime we read or write to that uh, cache. Okay, so this is kind of the demonstration of that. Okay, then we're going to have our regular old while loop for our server that's going to accept connections. Okay, and we're going to do things a little bit differently here. This is the part where I said, don't pay any attention to this, just look at it and go, wow, we'll learn about that next week. We're going to set up a, this thing called a struct socket address uh, underscore IN for the actual IP address. The reason we're going to do this is because whenever we get a client, we want to actually know what IP address it came from. Why might we care about that? We want to log it. Maybe we're, maybe we're a program we want to 
who cares about Scrabble words the most in the world? What, I, like what regions of the world? And we might log that or whatever. Trust me, every website you go to logs your data. It logs your IP address, it logs what you asked for. It lo this is how people get collect your data. Always logging d details about you. In this case, we're gonna care about what the IP address is. Okay, and the way we're gonna do this is this stuff, which I'm not gonna go through the details now, but we will see it next week. And it's, uh, it's basically used to get the client IP address um, in this case, okay? And we are going to, once we get it by doing all this fancy uh, searching through the, uh, the response, we're going to say uh, that where we got it from. And we have to actually print it out correctly and so forth. But it's basically gonna say, hey, received a connection request from IP address. That's what we care about. Okay, then we are going to schedule the thread so that we can then go back quickly and do another accept. And we're gonna do that by, by calling our publish Scrabble words function, which itself we'll call subprocess. And we're gonna do that, we need to pass in the client we're going to, uh, the, the file descriptor for that, pass in the cache by reference as it turns out, and pass in the cache lock also by reference. That's what we're gonna do. Okay, that's the big idea of our program. And then everything happens in publish Scrabble words where everything starts to happen there. Questions on this one? No fair asking about the details we'll do next week. Okay, all right. Uh, so like I said, all of this address size, inet, end top, we'll talk about that next week. It's kind of cool, okay? Published Scrabble words is going to rely on subprocess. We are going to eventually create JSON output um, and then we are going to uh, see how that works. So let's take a look. And this next function is pretty detailed. We'll do it line by line. Uh, it's called Publish Scrabble Words, and it is on what page? Seven. So I'm right before it. Okay. All right. So here's what it is. Uh, you've got it on your thing. I'll try to. I'll hopefully you can kind of see it from the back there. Um, so here's what we're going to do in Publish Scrabble Words. Okay. We are going to make it so that we can write to the client pretty easily, or uh, read and write as it turns out from the client pretty easily, okay? We are going to call a function called get letters, which is going to request, the, which is going to uh, take the request we got and figure out what the, after the slash for the uh, web page that we're looking for, and use those as the letters, okay? Then, as we said, we're going to sort them because we don't care what the order is, but it's going to make, make a difference for our cache. Okay, we're then gonna time it. So why do we care about timing it? Again, it's, this is like our own little benefit of, hey, how long did it take to do this? Maybe it's gonna take too long or whatever. Guess what, the cached one should take much fewer, much less time than the actually running the program. Let's hope that that's the case. We'll see if that's the case as we go. Okay, we're gonna just get the time for the start and that's how you do that. This is kind of what I showed you uh, last week when we did the, the time server client. Similar sort of idea here. Now we're about to update the cache, or rather we're gonna see if our letters are in the cache. So first we lock it, then we do a find on our map, okay? And then we immediately unlock. Don't lock for longer than you have to, okay? We could have just done a lock guard and for the rest of the function, just been guarding that, um, that uh, uh, variable, or the, the, the map but we don't want to because we want other threads to also be able to read to it and other threads to be able to update it. So don't lock for longer than you have to. That is a definite style issue that also can just affect your program runtime. So be very careful about doing that, okay? If we were basically coming up with a little Boolean that says whether or not we found the cache or not, or found the, the uh, string in the cache, and um, we're gonna create a vector that we're gonna put those words in. If we are cached, we're done. <laughs> right? We basically say, great, the words that the, in the vector are the words from our cache, end of story. Okay? The way find works is it gives you back a pair. The second part of the pair, of the iterator rather, it gives you back an iterator. Um, and the second, the second thing in the iterator is the actual vector in that case, the, the value from the map. Okay? So it's going to do that. Otherwise, we didn't find it in the cache. Well, now we need to actually go and use our subprocess. So we're going to call our subprocess, we're gonna set up our subprocess command. How are we gonna do that? Scrabble word finder is the name of the program. Letters.cstring, that's the letters we just obtained. That's the second parameter, or the first parameter to our, um, to our program, and then null. That should look pretty familiar from your Stanford shell. 
Okay? Then we're going to call a function called pull formable words, and we're going to pass in a reference to the vector, and we're going to pass in the file descriptor we get back from subprocess. This is basically doing, saying, hey, we're going to get all the words out of subprocess, throw them into that vector, one line at a time. Fairly straightforward. And don't forget, we have to wait till we're done, <laughs> right? If you're doing multiprocessing, you have to do wait PID. This, is, this example ties in everything we've done so far, as it turns out, okay? And then, once we get the result back, we know we weren't cached before, we better put our vector into the cache. So, we lock, our, uh, we lock our variable, our map, we lock around our map, I should say, via the cache lock. Then we update the cache with uh, the vector based on the key of the letters that, have, that are sorted now, and that's it. We can use a lock guard because when this goes out of scope, the lock comes on, really, it gets unlocked. Wait, wait, wait. Say, say again. We purposely, we previously said to do what? Oh, right, 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 right. Um, we shouldn't call sub process with. You can call. Let's see. You can call in this. Oh, good question. <laughs> That's the question. The question is, wait, we shouldn't. We shouldn't mix threading and multi processing. Uh, in this case, it's actually going to be okay uh, because subprocesses, we're very careful in subprocess only to allow the, uh, it's still in the same thread in that case, okay? I mean the thread, now you do have, you're right, you do have multiple, you have multiple processes in that thread, but we are waiting for it properly and we are uh, doing that okay. So yeah, in this case it's all right. Yeah, I, I think, uh, let me look into that in a little more detail. And yeah, that's a good, good point though, because we always, we said don't mix uh, don't mix those in that way. It, it, yeah, it does turn out it works, but that's a good question. Uh, so I'll look into it. Yeah, good question. Yes? Can you go over again why we shouldn't usually mix? Yeah, of course. We're going to go down this path now. Okay, why should we not usually mix? If you are, if you are in a thread and you're calling multi, um, uh, you're calling, a, you're, you're forking off a process, right? Well, then the thread is now kind of outside your process and like it's in its own like that the, the thread has to coordinate now wait wait now I've got this other process going on but I'm processed and I've got thread so it's not necessarily a good thing which is why I'll have to look up why this actually works but the, the in, in that sense you don't want to you've got a thread manager and a process manager and they don't always work well together okay in a process you should be able to call threads but we're doing the opposite here so I will look this up and see why yeah I'm not but otherwise you don't it's basically because you've got two scheduling things going on that don't like to necessarily, they won't necessarily work well together. But good, good question. This is a good point we brought up. Yeah, Rune. Right, so the question is, go over again why we use the locking here and not the lock guard, but we're able to use the lock guard down here. And you're absolutely correct. Your comment was, up here, we need to unlock here before there's any scoping going out of, anything going out of scope. Nothing here is going out of scope. So if we tried to use a lock guard, it wouldn't actually go out, they would, the lock wouldn't release until somewhere down here where we're out of the scope. And that's not what we want. But here, because the last thing we're about to do is update the cache and then to definitely go right out of scope, we can use the lock guard. Exactly right. Yeah. You don't have to. You could do lock here, unlock after the cache. Perfectly fine. You will not get marked. Nope, it's not a style issue. No, it's just it's a style. It's a style, but it's not a bad thing to do with the lock unlock. Perfectly fine. Chase, you had a question? No. Okay. Got another hand over here. Okay. Good questions on here, very good questions, but that's, that's the meat of this here. After we get the words out, well, that's how long it took, so then we get the end time, okay? Then we do a little, uh, a couple more commands to, or functions to actually figure out what the duration of the time was in seconds. This is using the, uh, uh, another time, uh, time val struct, 
And in this case, just it just uses the seconds plus the millisecond or microseconds divided by a, a, a million, which gives you the seconds. And that's how that one works out. And then uh, we are going to set up the payload. Now, the payload in this case is we're going to basically construct the payload from the words, from whether or not we've been cached or not, and from the time. And then we are passing in this string. We want a string that we are going to send back to the client. We have to construct that. It doesn't kind of come for free. We have to kind of create a JSON uh, string out of it. Okay. Once we construct that payload, we then send it using another function called send response. Okay. All right. So the payload is the JSON part. The payload is a string that we're going to send back to the client, and that's JSON. You'll see it when we when we build it. Okay, this is a long function. Other questions? Very good question about the uh, multi-threading, multi-processing. Uh, other questions on this one? And good threads. Good question about the locks. Mikhail. Uh, just in general, when it stores the information about the time in the ID, does it always, like, does it just keep it for the duration of the program, or does it uh, store it somewhere and always keep it until the information? Yeah, the question is, hey, how does this time thing work, basically? Up here, we are creating a very local variable called start. It happens to be of a, a type Time, struct time val, and then we're populating it with the current time. Get time of day, we'll say, what time is it right now? And populates that. And then whenever we, and then we just keep that locally. And then later, after we do all of our checking, or all of our creating the words and so forth, we then say, that took this much time, we do it again, we get the time of day now, subtract the two, and we get the duration. Exactly what you would have done in the midterm. Again, it's tying everything together. Yeah. The sock stream at the top is for basically uh, reading in the data, which we will, let's see, we will, we will write out the data here, and then, let's see, do we read it anywhere else, or do we already have it ready? Is that get letters? Yes, the get letters, get letters is going to read from that one. Yeah. So what's O string stream? Uh, an O string stream is we are going to build up a string, and that's how you do this. Right? It actually um, it allows you to take a string and build it up one piece at a time. It's kind of how it works. You could do it as a regular string, but this is like a string builder in Java. You know, you might have used in Java. That's all. You'll see how it works. You'll see how it works in a, in a minute. Other questions on this one? Okay, let's move on. Okay, so the pull formable words. This is where we need to um, use the file descriptor we got from our subprocess to actually create all those words and put the words into a vector. It's pretty straightforward, right? We are going to do this, which is not something you may have seen before. This is actually uh, creating a, uh, it's basically creating a data structure that allows you to create an input stream <laughs> for, that for C++. That's all that is. And then we read one line at a time from the subprocess and after we read one line at a time, we, uh, when, until we get to the end, we then push it into the vector. All there is to it there. And that vector is the reference, so we don't need to return it or anything. Okay. All right. Send response. Well, remember, we've already constructed the payload. We'll see that in a minute. Okay. Send response does the following. Well, it actually is the reverse of the get command. Okay, the get function. It's the server sending data back. Before, when we did the get time server, we didn't care what the format was. It was our own special format. We now want this to be so that a web, uh, a web like a client or a web browser could use our server. We're actually raising up the stakes here. Now we're saying, oh, let's do this from our, from our uh, browser. So the browser is expecting the response to be in the following format. It's expecting us to say, we are using HTTP 1.1 slash or 1.1. Then it says, what is the status? Okay, in this case, it's 200. And if you go look up, let's see, uh, let's do it this way. H, HTTP 200, it says, it says the HTTP, HTTP 200 OK status response code indicates that the request has succeeded. So you get back a 200 that says, hey, your request succeeded. There are lots of things that could go wrong. 
The server could time out some reason. That would be a different command. That would be a different one. The server could have moved. Remember the one we got before, which was, what was it, 300 or whatever? It says, look, this means the server has moved. You can look up the, all of the, uh, you can look up all of the status codes. And all the status codes are right here. 200 is okay. 201 means it's, something's created. There's an accepted. You're basically the server sending back to the data to the client saying, here's what's going on right now. And, it's, and generally, you're looking for 200, which says, great, everything worked out. Okay? The ones that did redirection is the ones we saw before. Okay? And that's the command, the ones that client errors are 400, saying the client says, oh, I screwed up. Right? Or you screwed up. I get a server saying, hey, you screwed up. You didn't ask for the right thing, or you didn't give in the right form, or whatever. Bad request, or unauthorized, or whatever. 500s are, I screwed up. The server screwed up, which are down here. Internal server error, maybe I gave the wrong issue. There's timeouts or whatever. Um, there's one that, let's see. Uh, there's one called I am a teapot, which is 418. Is that one in here? There we go. Um, one of the original web servers ever was a little web server that basically said whether or not coffee was ready in an office. Sounds pretty banal, but that's the way things work the, you know, when they create these things. The first web server um, was this. So somebody coded this up and said, if you get 418 back, it means you're a teapot. Why? Well, that's the way it goes. It's kind of an Easter egg, as it turns out. Okay? All right. So, uh, so we will send back, okay, we will send back the, I am using HTTP 1.1, 1 .1, oh, 200, and then you also send an OK, which says everything worked out great, and then you send your little backslash R, backslash N. Then you send some headers. Now, this is where the server is sending headers to the client, okay? The header in this case is text slash, one of them is called content type. You will see that all the time if you're doing backend server work. Content type is what kind of data am I sending back? In this case, we're sending text slash JavaScript. And then we're also saying uh, what character set we are using, which is good so the computers around the world know how to translate what we're sending. Um, the text slash JavaScript is a little weird. Uh, I looked it up. I was, I was confused about why we were using that. Um, why we were using that ourselves. So I just looked up, like, what, oops, what should be the uh, content type? What should the content, content type be for JSON? And if you look it up, there's the first link there, of course, the Stack Overflow. It says, um, I've been messing around. Here are all the ones that I've used, seen used. Which one is correct? The one we were using is application slash, uh, no, it was text slash JavaScript. So you can use that one. But somebody says, no, 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 you should use application, no, sorry, you should use application slash JSON. That's what we should be using. So we could change this and do it. Basically, your browser, if it can figure it out and it knows most of these, it will figure it out. That's what we're trying to, in this case, it's saying, hey, what's the format of the response going to be? Okay, so that's what we're doing there. Okay, all right, then we are saying how long the data is. So the content length is how many bytes am I about to send you? Why do we need to send the data? Why can't we just put a zero at the end? It could be binary data. It could be a JPEG or some other data that's not text. And you can't have some particular character say when the data is ending you have to send the length so that the client knows to keep reading for that amount of data. Okay? Now, it could read until it ends, which is also probably fine, but it's good to, know, good to send it the data so it knows how much data it's expecting. Okay, normally, it would just keep reading until nothing's left and then say, oh, that's all the data. But that's that. Remember, after our headers, new line. So we're sending that new line there. And then we send the entire payload. And then we flush to make sure that it gets sent over the, data, over the network. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Okay, questions on this one, these functions? This response is what we have to send back so the website, or so the web browser knows what to expect. Okay, all right. A couple other ones we're going to look at here. The get letters function, which is uh, basically getting the letters from your client. Okay, how does that work? Remember, if you say, uh, if you say myth 58 slash A, B, C, D, E, well, you need the, you need the uh, 
port number in there too, but it's the A, B, C, D, E part we want to grab off of this. So let's see how we do that. Okay, what are we going to do? We are given the socket stream that we already set up. This is where we set that up earlier because we're about to read it. We are going to create a method string, a path string, and a protocol string because remember, there's get and then the path, A, B, C, D, and then the uh, HTTP 1.1, etc. Okay, so we need to do that. Method, path, protocol. We're going to read them in. The nice thing about a stream is you can do it one after the other. Boom, boom, boom. You read them in one, one after the other. It, reads it, it ignores the white space in there, or it breaks on the white space. All right, and then we need to get the rest, which is one more line, because we know that the rest, we're going to have um, one more line after that. Okay, and then we are going to just use the path. That's the only part that we use to do the um, to get the end of that path to get our letters out of it. So basically, we're using the fact that you're sending to a particular path, we're using that path as the letters. And that's how we're doing that. Okay? That's all there is to that. Return. Pause equals equals string and pause. We didn't find anything, right? What are we going to return back? We're going to return back the entire path. Otherwise, we're going to return just the stuff after the slash. Wait, what is yeah. Pause is, the slash. Pause is the slash in that case, yeah. All right, and then the construct payload part is going to do the JSON part. Now, JSON is a very particular format. It starts with a curly brace and it ends with a curly brace. And inside, it's got some fancy things. In fact, the one that's on the slide here, I modified a little bit so that I could show you something in a few minutes. Um, basically, generally, real JSON actually needs another quote around all the different parts here. So basically it needs a quote around all the parts and it's not reflected here. So I guess I should update that. But basically we're going to say the time, put the time, whether or not it's cached, we're going to put whether, true or false, and then the, the entire uh, vector of strings that we got back from the thing. When we said the status is okay, we're, we're saying, if we got to this point, we're about to send you a good string. That's what means the status is okay. So if you're to the point where you've collected all your data, it's good to go, and you're ready to send a response back, and everything looks fine, you send okay. You say, yep, I'm ready. It sounds like you give me a good response. Here it is. And that's that. Now, if anything else breaks in the middle, like the network goes down or something, you just won't get a response, and then it'll time out in the web browser and so forth. Okay, good question. All right, so we are ready to test it, and then I want to show you a couple other fun things. Okay, so I've got it all written here. It's going to be, uh, it is Scrabble, oops, it is Scrabble, Scrabble Word Finder Server. I am on Myth 59, and, oh no, uh, oh, I bet I'm on a different, um, mm, that's okay. Let's do one, two, three, four, five, and see if that works. There we go. Okay, so we're now on one, two, three, four, five. So if in another window we go to telnet myth 59, one, two, three, four, five, okay? Over here, notice it says received a connection request from 171.64.15.17. That's a log. It said that's, the, that's where we got the request from. Your IP address gets sent to whoever, and it has to, of course, gets sent to whoever your, the server is, and it gets logged, okay? All right, so let's do our little get command. We want to get slash... Uh, let's say Stanford, and then we're going to do HTTP colon or slash 1.1, and then we want to have like a host uh, myth 59. I don't think it actually, it just kind of ignores that for ours. And then that's that, and look what we got back, right? We got all our words back, which is kind of cool, right? So far, so good. Well, I promised you that we would be able to do this from a web browser, let's see if that works, okay? So if I type in myth59 colon 12345 slash, somebody give me a, a bunch of letters. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, okay? If this all works well, ta-da! There's our JSON that we got back, okay? It's kind of small, but that's what it is, and that's what we got back from our web server. So we created a web server, we made a web server that actually did this, okay? now. 
This is kind of interesting. And by the way, notice how long it took. 0.04 seconds. That's how long it took to do all that. If we do the same request again, it took 1.5 times 10 to the negative fifth seconds because it was cached for us. We, those words were already created for us. They were cached. Our server just went, here you go. I don't need to, re I don't need to call that subprocess baloney anymore. And Eva tells us it's probably not a good thing to do anyway. So it worked. That, that's how that worked. Okay. Now, you're saying to yourself, great, this doesn't look like any web page I've ever been to, right, with this stuff. So what you can do is you can, sorry, <laughs> that's true. Okay. What you can do is, let me open up, um, let me go to, okay. And let me go up here and do the same thing here, but in this case, myth, let's see, 59 colon 1345. Okay, so, oops, I didn't put a, that time I didn't put an actual uh, thing in there. In JavaScript, you can actually request websites from JavaScript. Okay, so let's actually do that. What you can do in, what's kind of cool about your, uh, your browser, and this is why I was using, um, I was using uh, Chrome because I happen to know how to use these ones pretty well. Let's see, that one you can close. So let's see, this is, can I make this bigger? Yes, I can. Okay, we're going to actually use what's called the fetch command to do this. So if I type fetch, that's actually uh, has the ability to fetch from a website. Okay, and if I type HTTP colon slash slash myth 59stanfordedu colon 12345, that's where we are, slash, let's do uh, Leland. Let's say we had those letters, okay? And then method, you take the method, in this case, what's wrong, did I spell it wrong? There's no Y, oh man, like that? Yeah, yeah sorry, it's sorry, I feel bad now. Okay, <laughs> I'm not gonna work here much longer, don't tell anybody, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> Oops, get. We're going to use the get uh, method here. Oops, I do need it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Syntax highlighting is nice. Okay, so we're going to do uh, get in this case. Okay, and then we're actually going to do uh, a thing called then, which is the part of the request that says how to do this. You do not need to know this, obviously. I'm just showing you that it works. We're going to return data.json because we know it's JSON. That's what we're expecting. Okay, and then we do another then, and in this case, this is the one that actually does the response. Okay, and what we can do is we can print it out. Console.log, which prints it to the log, response. Okay, and like that, and then we can actually catch the error if there's an error. There shouldn't be in this case, but there might be, who knows. Error, and let's see, console.log, and whatever the error is, we can do that. Okay, if all goes well, let's see, there we go. It gave us the amount of time it took, and it gave us that, and that's that. So we just wrote a little JavaScript function to do that. Again, you're saying to yourself, that doesn't look like any web page I've ever been to, okay? But what you can do is, uh, where do I want to go here? Uh, I think I put it, yeah, I put it on your website. By the way, you all can go from your web browser and do this. I don't know if anybody's tried that in the last five minutes, but what's that? Oh yeah, people are doing it, thank you. <laughs> I guess everybody's doing it. You can do that, I guess you, people are doing that. Uh, class CS110, www. Okay, uh, let's see. It is called scrabblewordfinder.html. I wrote a little HTML program to do this, and the reason I'm changing it right now is because I hard-coded, shouldn't do this, but I hard-coded the wrong, because I didn't know it was gonna be the wrong one. One, two, three, four, five in there. Okay, and basically it's setting up a little web page. So if you've done any web uh, word, web stuff before, you'll see I'm just setting up a head of the title of the web page and a couple of places to put the details and whatever. And if all goes right, we should make this a little bigger. Oops, we should be able to go to web.stanford.edu/class/cs110/scrabble. What did I do it? <laughs> Rebel word finder, word finder.html, and there we go. Okay, and we have our letters, and if we type L E L A N D, <laughs> correct this time, right, we should get it back, and there's our web page. So we created a, and that used, by the way, that fetch and whatever, and used the JavaScript and said, oh, I know what these things are, and it made it into a, still a dumb looking web page, certainly, but 
it now works just like any other web page that you might uh, might care about. Okay, so what are there weird words in there? Uh, you can get adorns from Leland. I don't know if you do that. What's that? No, you can't. You're right. Wait a minute. This didn't work. You're right. You can't. I wonder. Huh. What happened with that? Say again. Oh, I could Stanford. Did I really? No, I didn't. I bet I probably did. Oh my gosh, I did. You're right. Okay, I'll fix. I'll fix that. Wow. Good call. Good call. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Yeah. For some reason, I hard that. It would be easy enough to get. I don't know why. Why didn't? Uh, well, anyway, I didn't do it. So, oh, there it is, right there. We'll fix it right now, since we can. Uh, it's letters. I knew I got it out of there. I just forgot to do that. Uh, let's see, plus, uh, let's do this, slash plus letters. OK, live changing the website right there. Let's see if this works. Better? OK. OK. Um, oh, thank you. <laughs> When, I don't know if it's a good thing when you get applause after you make a dumb mistake. I, 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 fixing it might be the good thing. Um, okay, what other question do you have about this? That was a lot of code to look through today, but it's all in there and it's a lot of stuff we've seen over the years. I will find out about the multiprocessing, so that's a great question, and then we'll do that. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So good question. Um, if you just type myth 59, the web server is a different computer altogether. The actual Stanford web server is not on the myth machines. We created our own little server, which is kind of the cool part, right? But we created our own little server. The web server that Stanford uses is a professionally built, well, open source, but professionally built server that, is, that serves all the regular old Stanford web pages that you go to web.stanford.edu. That's where I put this one. But remember, this one goes to Myth 59. And I, highlight, I, I did hard code go to Myth 59 in this. OK, we go back to Chrome. Ah, this tab is my computer talking directly to Myth 59. How does it know where Myth 59 is? Remember the DNS server I mentioned the other day? That's where the domain name server. If you say, go to Myth 59, your computer and your, through your browser basically looks up what is that, what IP address does that connect to? And, and that, then it goes directly there. And that goes to Myth 59. This goes directly to Myth 59. If I'm in the website here, now I'm on the Stanford website, which I'm talk, the browser is talking to the Stanford website. The Stanford website, and through JavaScript, and, and it, the, that comes to me, and then it tells me the JavaScript I need to go to Myth 59 directly. So basically, I'm loading the web page from web.stanford.edu, which is the main Stanford website. And then I'm myself talking directly to Myth 59 on my computer here to get the actual words. You could probably do it a different way where you had this website or my computer talk back to the Stanford website, which then talks to Myth59 and does a, one more layer of indirection. But in this case, we, we skip that layer of indirection. I know, so it's a little, there's a lot going on there. Yeah? How does the parent like go to close the port between, or not the parent, the server, like close the port to the client, like at the end there? Yeah, the, the Port closing happens in, it, there it is. It happens when the uh, client uh, socket goes out of scope. So it's basically back wherever we created it. I think we created it right here. So it goes out of scope, like down here at the end of this function, and then it closes it. Okay. That's, where the, that's where the, in our case, the server closes the connection to the client. Yeah. Okay, good questions. All right, I, like I said, I'm glad to do office hours now. Feel free to stop by right after class and ask more questions. And we'll see you guys in lab. <laughs>